This is the day that the Lord has made. Hallelujah. We uh, join together in our hymn of inv invocation. Jesus Christ, 
Upon this year's confession, I, by virtue of my office and the call to our name servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And instead, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We read responsibly our appointed psalm for today, Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, and walks in his ways. You shall be delivered from the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and you shall be blessed. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see the Glory be to the Father and to the Son. And the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, the world Our Old Testament reading is from Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, 
This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading for today is Hebrews chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I, am I and the children God has given me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Please stand. Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? He replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. Jesus replied, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these." Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. We confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, 
God is God, light is light, very God is very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I invite you, as usual, to follow along in your worship folder on the screen, the outline for the message today, uh, based upon our scripture readings, and it's a very appropriate um, selection of scriptures we have here today for what we're experiencing, what we're seeing, what we're hearing in the culture, in the country today, and yes, even in the church of God. Um, And we need to take the Word of God seriously, once again. 
And I cannot overemphasize this. When I was preparing this message for this morning and looking at the scripture passages and then comparing what God's word says, juxtaposed against popular culture today, it's no less than shocking the contrast, the comparison, the diametrically opposed viewpoints here. And we've been like the proverbial frog in the kettle, boiling slowly in our culture. And like the frog in the kettle, if we do not recognize what's happening here, we're going to cook. Um, and the world will do what it does, but it's very important that we do not follow the world and cook with it. Uh, we are rapidly descending into a new age of paganism and anti-God and anti-Christ sorts of philosophies. And this is very, very troubling. So let's get into this and see what our scriptures say to us again. And we use this uh, opening from our psalm reading for today, Psalm 128, which says, Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to him. And we ask the question, how do we obey God and receive his blessing? And uh, again, the, the psalm is talking about blessedness. Uh, we ask this question sometimes. How's that working for you? When we look at the world around us and we have all these voices shouting at us, the alternatives to listening to God and his word and all these voices accusing of, us of everything from hypocrisy to uh, just outdated ideas to uh, all kinds of accusations and advocating for things that God's word opposes we respond with that initial question. How's that working for you? How's that working for the world? How's that working for society? How's that working in the church? How is that working? And we get into this. How's it working for marriage and family? How's it working for the pillars of society, the pillar of society, which forms the basis, the root um, of everything uh, up to and including government and how we treat everything. Where's the first social structure? And it's, we see this in, in our Old Testament reading to begin with. So let's start with this. Number one, I will be blessed if I obey God's order of creation. God's order of creation. These words are, are absolutely not accepted today by the broader culture. This turns people inside out to think that there's an order of creation that is given by God and not determined by you and me. Uh, the attitude today is we are free individuals. We are autonomous beings. There is no God, or if there is, he is not authoritative. And we are free to set up our own order not of God's creation, but a creation of our own, setting up God's creatures as God, we can determine what is good, what is best. And don't anybody tell me what to do. I'm a free agent. Well, yes, you do have freedom. But that does not make your choices right. And we have to ask this question, what is our source of authority? Today, and this has always been the way it has been, by the way, by human nature, by our own sinful nature, we, in our pride, like Satan and like his temptation, Adam and Eve, we want to determine what is right and true and good and best for us, for me. This is my right. But let's see what God has to say about order of creation. Okay. In our test, Old Testament reading, Genesis chapter 2, we have the Lord God speaking about creating man and woman. And also uh, talking about, uh, about uh, how, what this leads to with, with family. Uh, 
That is why, verse 24, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. And you go back in the verses, back to verse 20, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. The suitable helper is woman for man. That is God-given marriage. And man and woman are created by God. Not man and man, not woman and woman. And there is a sexual identity here. Uh, I was disturbed some time ago when a judge was not able to define what a woman is. I think uh, we're in trouble at that point. A woman is a woman, a man is a man. And just because people say, well, there are exceptions to that, we do not make the rule from the exception. The exceptions identify the rule. The, the alternatives point out the truthfulness of God's order of creation. And so we have this reality of God creating man and woman, and yet we, increasingly so in our modern society, are denying these things. And we have all kinds of alternative uh, definitions of marriage or all kinds of alternative de definitions of family and what the ideal is that God presents. And so we need to be clear about this. And this is painful for me to even contemplate that this needs explanation. And here I want to point out that how recent is this insistence that other people besides man and woman can be married. How recent an invention is this? The last five years, 10 years, maybe 15 years. Juxtapose that against all of human history. And even in the days of the Greek and Roman worlds, when there was much perversion going on, and much rebellion against the natural order, God's order of creation, there still was not the felt necessity to redefine what a man is or what a woman is or what marriage is. People didn't waste time with that. They just lived the way they wanted to, and they recognized that this was not normal, but hey, we're going to do it anyhow. But now, and this is all within the last few years, and it's being shoved down our throats like this is authoritative, like this is the way it should be. And we should not be uh, captured by things that have gone on before. We need to look towards what can be in the future. Here's a problem with that. We admit, is there progress in terms of technology, inventions, things like that? Absolutely. A more fundamental question. Has human nature changed? Or are we the same we've always been? Sinners. Fallen in a fallen world. And if we invent or reinvent God's order of creation, we are in deep trouble. Let me point out something that in, I invite you to do your own due diligence. You check it out yourself. Don't take my word for this, okay? How many babies have we aborted in the last 50 years? How many millions? What are business leaders and uh, demographers telling us today about the declining birth rate? What are the economists saying about the lack of workers coming in? In China, they have, they're facing a huge demographic challenge because they had a one-child policy. They tried to set themselves up as God, the Communist Party there, and decide to uh, only allow one child per family. And now they're facing a reduction of something on the order of 600 million Chinese uh, in the next few decades. A, a, 
a precipitous decline in the birth rate, which has huge economic uh, ramifications and social ramifications. We are needing to import labor nowadays. And I don't want to get into debate on immigration. It's not about that. But if you've heard commentators talk about this, they talk about the need to import labor because our demographics are not replacing the people and we're not growing like we should. This has ramifications. These are all byproducts of our denial of God's order of creation. God created man and woman. He made man and woman to be capable of human reproduction, to have children. In the traditional marriage ceremony, part of the order there is the pastor saying words to the effect of that God made marriage to bless be a blessing for man and woman. And we're so blessed to have children. This is how society and the world and the human race continues. And we think about the ridiculous things about emojis, for instance, nowadays, showing a pregnant man. That is insane. I was hearing about a form required in Great Britain under the medical establishment over there that has to they have to ask a man as part of a questionnaire if he's pregnant or not. Is this anything resembling sanity or not? I would not have thought we could have descended so far. This is a time for moral and spiritual clarity. This is a time for us to speak plainly. Order of creation is, is huge. And along with that is what we call natural law. When we, as has been uh, done, I read an article back in the 1990s talking about there is no such thing as natural law except that which we decide is natural law. That is a direct contradiction of the very definition of natural law that transcends human decision. And it does not work very well. Let me ask you this question by way of illustration. How well does it work to have government step in to take care of our children instead of parents? Nowadays, we're facing a reality that in certain places, by law, the push has been made to alter a child's gender surgically without parents' permission or even knowledge. This is the most evil kinds of things. And children who are so impressionable and they're being subject to these kinds of things. We need to uphold God's order of creation, natural law, marriage and family. Number two, I will be blessed if I obey God's order of salvation. God's order of salvation. A reading from Hebrews. Hebrews is a wonderful book. It's very um, deep intellectually and theologically. It really gets into Christ Jesus being the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. He is the fulfillment of the ceremonial law. He is the sacrifice that God has given for us and for our salvation. And the writer of Hebrews in verse 3 here says, How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? The salvation which was first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Now here, I want to mention, uh, this is something I was, I was listening to this week. And um, I, I'm going to uh, say what his name is because he himself has publicly talked about this. And I'm going to preface this by saying I have a great deal of respect for this man. Dennis Prager, if you happen to know who Dennis Prager is. He's a Jewish um, commentator. Uh, very well known, and uh, is is very good in many respects. But uh, as a Jewish, uh, religious Jewish uh, person, he uh, does not believe in Jesus Christ the way that you and I do. And 
And he was talking in this uh, video with some Christian leaders and theologians, and he was talking about why he is not a Christian. And he said, one of the things he said is that Jesus, he does not believe that Jesus is God. He believes in a traditional uh, Jewish formula that, that would deny Jesus' divinity. And then the other problem he has is he says, I don't believe that anybody can die for my sins. And he's willing to acknowledge that uh, he would not preclude Jesus from being the Messiah, but he just would, has a problem with him being uh, God or dying for his sins. But that goes to the very essence of what salvation is all about. And he tosses into this, uh, this idea that uh, Christians, he says, do not recognize one of the commandments. They recognize nine, but not the other one, which is the third commandment, he points out, the way we number them in the Lutheran church. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And I was very disappointed in the answers by the Christians there. I thought it was very inadequate. And the truth of the matter is, is we do believe the moral law of God, including all Ten Commandments, including the third one. So how come we don't worship on Saturday? Well, that's not the point. The, the third commandment has to do with recognizing where our rest comes from, ultimately and spiritually. And Hebrews points this out in this book that we quote from here in our epistle reading. Um, and it talks about Jesus being our Sabbath rest. We rest in him. We rest from our works. We have Sabbath rest seven days a week, 24 hours a day in Jesus. He's the fulfillment of the third commandment. We acknowledge him as such. We do listen to the third commandment. Well, here's a problem that Dennis Prager has. And again, I speak with much respect for this man. He is a friend of ours in the sense of we, are, we would acknowledge the same natural law and the same uh, uh, God's law together. But I remember him saying one time that he loves God's law, but he has a hard time loving God. Because the law of God is perfect and wonderful and true, but to try and keep it is so difficult. And it's hard to love the author of that law because he is our judge and we are imperfect. And he can seem very stern, very harsh as a judge in the, in the midst of our failure. And that's the sad part for me, is that if Dennis were to recognize and see that Jesus is God, and God can do whatever he wants. He has the power to be true God, true man. And indeed, we even see this in the Old Testament. We see the Trinity there even. And that God provides a solution for us that we could never come up with ourselves to save ourselves. We cannot do that. This is how we can love God. This is so sad that Dennis... Prager doesn't see this or understand this. This would give him the ability to love God because in the face of our failure, we have a Savior who died on the cross for our sins because of his great love for us that transcends our deeds or our failure to do the deeds we should do. God steps in with his Father's love for us, gave his only Son, to suffer our punishment because he loves us so dearly, because he made us and now he redeems us. He saves us. So we need to pray for Dennis Prager. We need to pray for all who cannot see the great love of God and his salvation. And we need to understand that in Jesus, we do have a Sabbath rest. This is the missing part for those who are caught up in just legalistic obligation to God. It would be like Martin Luther, and we're going to be remembering the Reformation later this month. Martin Luther, when he was a monk, 
before he understood the word of God and, and uh, the definition of the righteousness of God, Martin Luther, he had a hard time loving God. In fact, he said and confessed that he actually hated God because this God demanded such harsh uh, obedience that it was impossible to please him. And then he discovered that the righteousness of God was about what God provides us in Jesus. And he said it was like the gates of heaven opened for him and he could be joyful. And he was free now to love God because God provided his own answer for our need that we could not provide ourselves. This is the essence of salvation. We have a wonderful savior. Beautiful Savior. What a wonderful hymn. Number three. I will be blessed if I obey God's order of connection. Connection. It's all about relationship. It really is about being connected to God and with one another. And Jesus talks about this. And just as we are blessed if we obey God's order of creation, just as we are blessed if we obey God's order of salvation, so we are blessed if we obey God's order of connection, if we respond to the one who first loved us. The Pharisees came to Jesus. They were, they were testing him once again. They were always looking for weakness in Jesus or a failure. And of course, he never did fail. And they were constantly embarrassed. And they wanted to know if it was okay for a man to d divorce his wife because Moses um, allowed for this. And Jesus points out, yes, he did, but it wasn't part of God's will. It was allowing for human frailty and failure. Jesus himself says this, but at the beginning of creation, God, quote, made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And here we add just not only uh, an injunction against divorce, but an injunction to support the institution, the God-given institution of creation, uh, which, which includes marriage between a man and a woman for a lifetime. We are at a stage now where we are dealing with a disconnected world. So many people are fragmented in their lives. They don't have family like we used to assume people have. We have marriages collapsing. We have kids being farmed out to various parents. And children understand so much more sometimes than their parents do about how important marriage and family is. God puts that in their hearts. And now they're being even victimized. They have been turned into objects of sexual pleasure even. We hear about human trafficking. We hear about all of these terrible things involving the abuse of children. These are broken connections. They're broken with God. They're broken with one another. This is not the way God intended it. We need to be advocates for the truth here. Now's the time for courage. Now's the time to have a backbone. Now's the time to speak truth and to oppose these evil things that are going on. Now's the time to lift up the truth of God and his word and say, we're not going to apologize for this. We're not going to um, fudge around the edges. We're going to speak with a clear voice here. Because our children, their lives depend on this. Their happiness, their safety, their security depends on this. And our, our, our culture, our world depends on this. We have to stand firm. I want to finish with this. Um, as you know, we've been uh, starting a project, a law enforcement Bible. And in that Bible, in the introduction I wrote, 97-page uh, introduction to introduce the Word of God to those who may not know what it's all about and to try and lead them into this. We also cover things like marriage and family and the importance of them and how we need to all support them.
But we have very exciting developments here. Uh, I did a trip out to North Dakota this last week. We are going to put in the hands of every North Dakota law enforcement officer one of these Bibles. We are shipping 2,000 of these Bibles to North Dakota. And Elaine and I will be returning to North Dakota at the end of this month to help with that distribution and do that kickoff there. We've got Bibles coming here. Neil's been looking at shippers. <laughs> You're showing me shippers this morning. We've distributed these before and people have been hungry for these. This project deals with the kind of issues that we're talking about here. And there's a ripple effect. It isn't just about law enforcement officers. It's about the ripple effect to their families or to the, their churches or to their circle of acquaintances and friends in and outside of law enforcement. We need to do what we can to support these things. I want to read you this uh, letter that we received uh, this past week. Um, this is one of our partner groups. We talk about connection. We talk about relationship. We are connected in mission here. This came from um, Pastor Todd Jerebeck and his church, Zion Lutheran Church uh, in Wisconsin, to us, dear friends in Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. At our last congregational meeting, God's Word for Peace Officers was selected to receive a gift of $1,211.91. This money is a portion of the dividend that comes from the Harvey and Edna Schmidt Endowment every year, which Zion is entrusted as steward to distribute. The money is being sent and to be used for printing and distribution of as many copies as possible. Reverend Stephen Lee is a longtime friend of our pastor, Reverend Todd Jerebek. They met one another at the seminary, and it was Pastor Lee at that time, Seminarian Lee, uh, who enticed him to consider volunteering as a police chaplain as a way to serve the community at large. It is our hope that this one-time gift will be as great a blessing. As well as this gift, please know that this project is now in our prayers. Peace of the Lord be with you in Christ. That's connection. That's connection in the mission. Now's the time in the face of what in some instances is the madness around us, the time for us to join together and connect with one another for God's work, God's word, God's blessing. May you be blessed as you rest in him. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand.
Please stand. God, our Heavenly Father, we come in your presence this day. Lord, we thank you for your truth in your word. Lord, without your word, without you, we would be ships lost in the night, headed towards the rocks of circumstance and sin. But Lord, you are our North Star. You are our compass in life. You provide us the way to salvation, the way to new life, the way to eternal life. Lord, help us to always honor you, your word, your order of creation, your order of salvation, your order of connection. Lord, this day we uh, join together in praying for our country and uh, for our world. We pray for the terrible situation in from the hurricane. We pray for those people there that they will find uh, healing and recovery. We pray, Lord, that you provide them what they need. We pray for comfort for those who have lost loved ones. Lord, we pray for uh, the help to get there that, that is needed. We pray, Lord, that our government leaders would, would have the right priorities uh, and would be servants, uh, not masters of the people. Lord, we pray for the warfare we see, and for the terrorism and other conflicts in our poor, hurting world. We pray, Lord, that you would raise up good leaders. We, we pray that you would restrain evil. We pray, Lord, that each one of us in our own way would be beacons of light in the dark. Uh, world. Lord, help us to always have your peace in that process. Help us never to give in to hopelessness and despair, but always understand that you, you sit on your throne, that you love us when we have a plan, and that we can trust you and we must trust you and have peace in that. Lord, we pray for healing for those who need it. Dottie, Greg, Julie, Bob, Jim, Mary, Pastor John, Neil, Peter, Jay, Dan, John, Randy, the Jeske family, uh, Lord, be with them. And Lord, we pray for safety and protection for those traveling. Uh, we pray for all students and schools they attend. Lord, uh, we pray for safety for our kids, for our children. We pray, Lord, that they would have the love and protection that they need. Uh, Lord, and now, be with us and bless the sacrament uh, as we prepare to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation, humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you, saying,
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us to harm and pain, but deliver us from evil. Peace of the Lord be with you always. body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, forgiven and dead for all of your sins. Take me. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, forgiven and dead. drink the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed for you for the truth. Now may this true body, true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, keep and preserve you steadfast.
<laughs> All right. Um, I just have a few announcements. Um, we have not sent off the checks for the Honey Bee Sun or Honey Sunday yet. So if you did still want to squeeze in an order, we can do that. But we'd like to do that today so that we can get those off and into the mail. Um, our October mission of the month is actually a fundraiser for our preschool to kind of raise some money for our free uh, preschool. We're doing it with nothing but fun cakes. Um, so we do have an order form in the back. All checks would need to be made to Nothing Bunt Cakes, and then they would be here on November 18th, so right before uh, Thanksgiving time. So if you want to have an easy dessert, order some Bunt Cakes. So, <laughs> um, yeah, there's an insert in the bulletin. Um, the call committee and the council will be meeting with President Buss on November 14th um, to kind of discuss. Oh, 24th, yeah. My dates, I don't know any dates right now. <laughs> November 24th, um, we'll just kind of be discussing our next steps with the church and how we can, you know, continue moving forward. Um, I really don't know of any other. Is there anything else, Beth? Yes. Yeah, the letters for Peter. Oh, yes, thank you. So um, there is stationery in the back. Bev did send out an email, but uh, Peter Wasselkoff is actually going on another honor flight. And so if you'd like to write him a little letter, uh, they do have to be mailed out by tomorrow uh, in order for him to get it. So if you want to, you know, or you could jot down the address if you want to go home today and write something and then mail it out. Just make sure it gets out tomorrow so that they have it in time. Yeah, but he's going to be doing it. Okay, so yeah, we can get that for you if you don't want to sit here and write something. But he, uh, it's nice they give him all a pile of letters after he gets off his honor flight. So just something, you know, kind to do if you'd like to. Um, is there anything else from the congregation that I need to announce? This is what happens when I don't write notes. <laughs> all right, well then, wave to the camera and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Pastor. We're glad you're back. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.